Alright guys, well welcome to my garage again. Uh, I have here a uh, 42 LE transmission, or also known as a A606, off of a uh, Dodge Intrepid, I believe it's like a 03 or 04, and uh, it's from the same automotive shop with that 48 RE, they did a good job on that one except for that uh, lip seal, if you already watched that video you know what I'm talking about. And uh, they're doing their own rebuilds, and uh, I mean, they're doing a real good job. And sometimes, I mean, they get stuck like on this one. They can't. They haven't delivered it yet. It's not been delivered. They pulled it out a couple of times, and they couldn't figure out what's going on with it. And uh, it could be in the transmission, or it could be in the car. They claim it had no codes. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and do a teardown inspection here, and. Uh, Everything should be new because uh, they, they just built it and they pulled it a few times already but they can't figure it out. So uh, that's what we're going to try to do, back trace every single step and uh, see if we can find out uh, why this thing is not working. Uh, they claim that uh, it shifts, it kind of wants to shift but it binds up. Uh, let's see what we're going to be able to find here. Okay. The first thing I want to do, I want to I want to remove this uh, This uh, axle here, he goes from uh, one side of the transmission, he goes to the front of the front of the pump, and he goes to the differential. Now this is a front wheel drive unit, but it's an inline motor, like if it would be a real wheel drive. So you have uh, the differential here, you have the final drive uh, here, 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 and uh, you have everything from the barrel of the case, and in the back you have a chain uh, that would move the final drive to move the differential. All right, well, uh, now that I got that removed, now let's get that thing out, out of the way. Pops right out. This is what it looks like. Now we're going to lose a little bit of uh, gear oil. It takes separate oil, gear oil here on the side, and you have a tag here. It's, it takes 80, 90 weight. So if you do one of, the, uh, one of these units, and you fill the transmission up with transmission fluid and you forget to fill this thing up, not only are you going to destroy the differential, but you're going to destroy the case as well. So uh, just make sure that whenever you do one of these units, you fill this up uh, with uh, gear oil and you have the fill plug right here, and that's actually your level. You know, just like in any differential. All right, I'm going to go ahead and take the pump bolts off. five bolts, you use an eight millimeter socket to remove them. Now here on the linkage to remove the valve body, uh, always put it on uh, manual load position. That way you'll get your uh, a parking rod, the one that activates the parking pole and puts it in park. You want to put it in manual load so it'll latch in the valve body. Once I remove that, I'll explain that to you why you want to do that. Take that out of the way. Now the, the input and the output speed sensors, uh, it's best not to use an impact wrench to remove them. The reason why is because uh, some of the uh, speed sensors depends on the brand. Uh, the internals are hollow and whenever you put an impact wrench you might dis uh, disrupt the circuit in there and sometimes you will open the circuit and the sensor may not work again. Uh, but there's some uh, aftermarket sensors like Raybestos. Uh, they have uh, they actually fill all the way. They're not hollow. They're filled all the way with uh, with the plastic, and uh, you can use an impact wrench on those. But you don't know which ones you got, so just get it's a one inch one inch socket. Just loosen them up, take them off by hand. They come out very easily. Now this is the output speed sensor. And this is the input speed sensor. You can see some, uh, it's probably just paint. But see the input and the output speed sensors are different. I mean if you see the output speed sensor it has a coarse thread on it and you have a little tip. And yeah it does have some uh, friction material stuck on it and of course you're going to have some material on it because this is a magnetic sensor. It has a magnet on the tip. 
and as you see the input speed sensor is a fine thread so you cannot mix them up I mean there is no way that you can do that but uh, I mean that's the way they look and they are physically different you use the same socket in the back the connections are also different the taps are uh, one opposite the other okay so uh, so there we have that. So we're going to lose some uh, gear oil here once I tip this thing over. Let's go ahead and uh, take our valve body off. We already have a uh, transmission fluid leaking. And it's brand new transmission fluid, like I said. Uh, they can't get this thing delivered for some reason. Sometimes it's better to have the vehicle with you because you know that uh, you can run some tests on the car. But this is not going to be the case. Oh man, look at that. That does not look good at all. That does not look good at all. And I have a, see all this black stuff? Something's going on already. I mean, the customer has not even got the car back yet, and something's getting, something's going on in here. Let's find out. All right, well, that's the, this is our filter. Now, uh, it has two little clips that you can unclip it. And just make sure that your uh, O-ring is on the filter. It's actually not, not on the filter, but it is here. It is present. Sometimes you would, uh, you would do an oil change or transmission fluid change and filter and this o-ring does not come in the filter. I mean some aftermarket filter they already started putting this o-ring on there but uh, most of the filters that you get this o-ring is not on there and if you don't pay attention you may change the filter without the o-ring and uh, you're going to cause a, uh, uh, an issue here and actually you will throw a code. I can't remember the number of the code, but it will say a loss of prime. I'll look that up and uh, I'll probably put it in the description. I see here that I'm already missing one of these brackets. It takes two brackets to hold the filter down in place. It depends on how the filter is flexing in there. I don't think it's creating an issue, but if the filter falls off and you have uh, air going through through the little hole, through the inlet hole, then you can probably have uh, some uh, a loss of prime codes. Whenever you get a loss of prime code or, or this is missing, you also get like a P0731 gear ratio error in first gear. Okay, so we get all, all of our uh, valve body bolts, and it's all the 10 millimeter head bolts. So you use a 10 millimeter socket. And now we're going to go ahead and uh, lift our valve body up. We'll pry it a little bit. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about. So here I got the. Uh, the lever, right? This is park. This is this is the uh, this parking rod right here will go all the way to the parking pole and activate park. If you try to get this uh, this valve body out in this uh, position, it will not come out. Actually, you will end up bending this and uh, uh, damaging it. So you want to put it. See, the valve body has a little clip right here. So you want to put it in manual low. right there and it latches on there I mean it, that, that's what that clip is for I mean just for security reasons that when you're disassembling this unit I mean this is in place and you won't damage this rod if it's inside the, the parking pole pulling this valve body out I mean you may damage it and uh, our solenoid pack if you have a solenoid pack code I mean, you have to drop the valve body off because the solenoid pack is mounted on the valve body. Unlike the 41 TEs or the 604s, the valve body is on the outside of the transmission. On the uh, 42 LEs, 
42 RLEs, uh, they are inside of the transmission. All right, we have uh, two accumulator accumulators here, and you have to make sure some models only take uh, one outer spring like this one, like like this. But this model uh, takes on both accumulators on, the, on both positions. He has a double spring. You want to pay attention to that. You have the 2.7 liter engine. You have the uh, 3.5 liter engine, and then you have the uh, the 3.8 as well. You know, and it depends on the engine size uh, if it does have double or if it just have single. So just pay attention to that. All right, so uh, now that we have our valve body out of the way, let's go ahead and remove our pump. And what I want to do here, I just want to get a little screwdriver here and just kind of pry on the uh, input drum. And that should get my pump loose. As you saw, I already pushed it forward. You want to make sure that your ceiling rings are in their respective position. That the, the ceiling rings is not where, like here you can position the ceiling ring in between where they should go, but these are in their respective position. Now as you can see, you can, you can see a little bit of yellow here, so that's a new ceiling ring. Like I said, uh, it's being rebuilt, they cannot deliver it, let's find out why. 13 millimeter socket. our pump stator. Now uh, whenever you get a vehicle in and uh, it is very common for the uh, Chrysler units that the, the, the torque converter clutch ends up uh, in the pan it gets destroyed and some of these little filters will be uh, contaminated with torque converter clutch material. This is not the case because they they've been working on it and uh, they can't get it out so this unit should be fairly clean the pump it's a little it's a little discolored but you can still see the blackness on it and uh, this pump is in good shape. Once you see it all, all nice and chrome and white when the pump gears are black then you want to get your uh, feeler gauge and see how much uh, clearance that you got. But if you can still see some black on it, you don't have to worry about that. The pump gasket. Now I'm going to push this thing over to the side a little bit. Now here's our input drum. Let me see if I can get the camera here a little bit angled to the work area. Give me a sip of coffee. Coffee's good, makes you concentrate good. That's what call it. All right, let's get this. Uh, this uh, uh, washer here actually goes on the uh, two four clutch. Uh. Now the first thing that's going to come out is the reverse, the reverse clutch. That's the snap ring. Kind of try to look for the opening. I mean, it'll make it easier for the snap ring to come out. Okay, here's the snap ring. It's pressure plate. Take that pressure plate off. And we have uh, two reverse frictions. And as you see here, this is a high energy friction. It's a brand new clutch. It's new. Now we remove, kind of try to look for the opening, the opening is right here. Another snap ring. This should be a flat snap ring and it is. The one next on the bottom one, it should be the, uh, the wavy snap ring, but this is the flat one. So just pay attention where the, 
where the snap rings are coming out from. And also pay attention as the position that this comes out. Uh, and this was installed in the proper position. You have a little step right here which goes to your overdrive frictions and the flat side would go to your uh, uh, reverse frictions. But if you're not sure and if, if you, this is the first time you do this, whenever you uh, get something out like this, always put a mark an X or uh, whatever you, a letter or whatever you want to do, an arrow. Uh, and that way you'll know that this came out of, in this position. Okay. Now we get the overdrive frictions out. Same here, brand new frictions, high energy. I don't know if the camera can pick this up, but they are kind of a uh, greenish in color, like uh, maybe like an olive green, maybe. But those are brand new frictions, those are new frictions. Now this, uh, the next snap ring that's gonna come out, the, this is a uh, tapered snap ring. And it kind of goes inside the groove pretty good. So uh, I'm going to see if I can uh, go behind the snap ring by uh, tapping behind the snap ring. Sometimes you would need like a little pick to kind of lift it up. It comes a little difficult sometimes. Especially when uh, I'm trying to put this so y'all guys can see it. I mean, I put this against my body, you know, just to hold it. But here I'm going to put it against that transmission so you can get a better shot at it. So here's my snap ring. I'm going to rotate a little bit and hold it with my finger. I don't know if that, you can see that right there. Coming out. Overdrive snap ring. It's tapered on the top side and flat on the, on the back side. This is our uh, forward clutch hub. Just inspect it, make sure it's in good shape. Overdrive clutch hub also. Uh, okay, this five tab little washer goes on the forward clutch hub or the uh, uh, underdrive clutch hub. And you have another one that looks similar, but that goes on the two forward clutch hub. And you have a, uh, a race, a three tab race that goes here. And then you have another race. This is select selective. Uh, and uh, you use this uh, selective uh, uh, plates here for your uh, input clearance. So we get those two hubs out. We get our, our uh, overdrive and underdrive uh, intermediate plate. And uh, this one here, the big step goes to the underdrive. And then you have a little notch cut out so you can get your snap ring. Uh, in there and this side will go to your overdrive frictions. Now we get our underdrive. Okay. I have two frictions. So here, here's probably our bind up. I have two frictions here together to adjust the clearance. Now the computer has a CDI index or clutch volume index on the, and with your scan tool, you, know, you can go and retrieve the CDI index. And it would have been a good idea to uh, do that on this unit. And you would actually find out which uh, clutch volume index was too tight. So here we have the underdrive friction. But I believe this is going to be our issue here. So I can see the steel there a little bit black. Okay, this is a flat snap ring. 
the flat snap ring goes first, then this plate sits on top of the flat snap ring, and then the tapered snap ring. So here it takes four frictions. And I believe this is going to be our issue here. This clutch pack is going to be too tight. Now on uh, 41, on the 604, 606, it is very rare that you want to do this right here. I mean, if you get a good quality kit, I mean, this is an old friction. This is an old friction as well. This is a new friction. And they use half of the uh, new friction and half of the old friction, you know, to get the clearance a little tighter. I don't know why they did this, but I don't recommend this. Usually, when you buy the kit, you're going to have uh, 10 frictions, and they're all the same. On uh, the earlier kits, yeah, you have uh, uh, like 12 frictions, and then you have some that were a little thicker, because on the earlier model, on the overdrive friction, then you want to adjust your uh, clearances. But whenever we go back with this together, we're going to go ahead and uh, check our clearances on this drum. I'm going to go ahead and uh, disassemble this right here. I'm going to go to my foot press and uh, I get this uh, the input shaft off and then try to disassemble here. Make sure that all of our lip seals are where they're supposed to go and that we don't have any uh, lip seals or orange missing. And this is the other snap ring that I told you about. This is a wave snap ring. Uh, I don't know if I got a position there in the camera that you can actually see the wave on it. All right, well, uh, well before I, I do that, let's go ahead and uh, finish digging into the barrel of the cage. We already saw one issue here that I believe is going to be part of the problem. And me and you guys are going to be part of the solution here. All right, I'm get my long screwdriver, and I'm going to take my 2-4 uh, uh, piston housing. under pressure this, this is a flat snap ring and it's a little wide and kind of uh, uh, stiff now we pull on our 2-4 clutch hub assembly and this 4 tap washer here goes here this is our return spring let's go ahead and uh, look in here It is a new D-ring or leaf cut seal in here. The reason I can tell is because it's under it's under uh, tension here. It's kind of hard to get out, so that means that it is a new a new uh, D-ring in here. Get a wider screwdriver. Lift up on it. Here we are. There we are. It is new. So they did put a uh, overhaul kit in this thing. Now we've got a front line assembly. And here the two four frictions are the thicker ones of the of both of them. And you take four and it takes four four thick steels and four thick frictions. And the two four frictions they look in very good shape. Now we have another tapered snap ring here. Go ahead and grab it with my finger here and get my screwdriver behind it. There we go. Another tapered. Flat side goes to the uh, separated plate there. And the taper side goes to your 2-4 uh, friction. Now let's go ahead and get our uh, separator plate here, or our friction plate for a low reverse, and the 2-4. And same thing as here, the big step goes to the low reverse and the uh, kind of flat side with a little tapered on the edge. This taper is for you to uh, help you get that snap ring in there. This goes to the 2-4s and this goes to the low reverse. All right, well, we have another snap ring here. This is a, a real thin snap ring, kind of flimsy. 
So uh, you can get your pick behind it and try to look for the opening and just pull it right out. Well, I got the camera positioned there. Let me see. There we go. All right, so here's a uh, flimsy uh, flat snap ring. And the flimsy snap ring goes underneath. And the uh, taper snap ring goes on top. You got the two four frictions on top and the low reverse friction down there on the bottom. We have our low reverse frictions here and these are thin uh, frictions and our uh, steels as well. I'm going to get one and one for a comparison just to, so you all guys can see. So I got one friction and one steel here. Let's see if I can zero this thing out. Friction and steel, 140 thousandths of an inch. One friction and one steel, 182 thousandths of an inch. So you got 40 thousandths of an inch difference between both of them together. Uh, let's do the uh, friction, 82,000, and uh, friction for low reverse is 71,000. So there you have the thin one goes for low reverse. Make sure you don't get those things mixed up because if you do, you're going to end up with the same issue here. You're going to have a bind. So uh, there we have it. Now in the in the bottom and the inside, all we see here is a. Uh, the sun gear and the rear planted assembly. You see here it's a fine thing you plant it. Now to get that out I need to get that big nut in the back. You know what? I'm, I'm going to take this, uh, I wasn't going to do this because I'm looking for the problem here and try to correct it. But I'm going to go ahead and take this cover off so you can see the rear of this unit. There is also a piston, the low reverse piston, underneath that uh, planted assembly. After this, we're going to go to the valve body and see uh, what, what else, what other issues we can find on the valve body itself. All right. Here's our rear cover. It's a double chain. On 95 models, you will see that they have a single chain. And the issue that uh, that we had back then in 95, I think it's, they stopped doing it like in 96 or 97. They went to a double chain like this. And the problem was that the chain would get real loose and it would jump. I mean, uh, Sort of like the 125s back back in the days, that the chain got loose, and you would try to take off uh, real hard from the stop, and then you would feel like a real bad shutter. Uh, it was actually the chain jumping, uh, so they went to a double chain, and actually it works fairly well. I mean, it, after the double chain, I have I have not seen that issue. Although this chain looks a little loose, I mean, it's just still in good shape. I would recommend replacing, but I'm going to go ahead and talk to the customer and see what he wants to do. Uh, but for now, they just brought it to, uh, to us just to correct the issue, and we're going to do just that, correct that issue. All right, well, uh, let me get everything ready here, and uh, I'll, be, I'll get back to you guys. Uh, let me go ahead and just assemble that drum, and then we'll look at the inside of the valve body, so we're, we're going to be able to find there. Okay, so before we go to our foot press, we're going to take uh, our input shaft off of the drum and I'm going to get my snap ring pliers and kind of open it up a little bit, the little snap ring that's in here, get my pick behind it, and as you see here, lift it up, 
and then get it out. I mean, it usually uh, comes off by hand, but sometimes it doesn't. So what I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna use the the ball side of this hammer just to hold the drum in place and hit the shaft. There we go. Shaft is removed. Now, so I won't lose this snap ring, I'm going to put it back into the shaft. And I know that my snap ring is going to be there, I ain't, I'm not going to lose it. Now we're going to go to our foot press. Let me get it closer over here. So we can disassemble this drum. Right here. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get my snap ring pliers and we're gonna remove this piston here. Just be careful that you're, uh, when, when you're putting your legs on your, uh, your footprint legs on your piston, that it doesn't slide. Because if it does, uh, you can get injured. So we remove the first snap ring. Now we go back to the bench. Get the foot press out of the way. We get our balance piston. Inspect it. You know, kind of feel for a, a rip or a tear. The lid feels good. And then it's followed by a uh, Return spring. Then we have our uh, underdrive uh, piston. Inspect it. Inside, sometimes it likes to wear and it cuts a groove in it, and the inner lip seal will not seal. So, this is our forward clutch or underdrive uh, clutch piston. And we have another snap ring in here. I don't know if you can see right there, we have another snap ring. We get our snap ring pliers. We remove this snap ring. Now, this snap ring here is is got a taper to it on the inside of the snap ring, and this taper goes towards you uh, for ease of installation. If you try to install it backwards, you're going to have a hell of a hard time getting it in and a hell of a hard time getting it out. So. Uh, just so you'll know, there's a taper to the snap ring, and the taper goes to you. The flat side goes toward the piston. Now, the reason I believe uh, that the bind up was within those frictions is because this drum, it has a very unique pattern of apply. It applies uh, forward and it applies backwards. I mean, once I get this thing together, I'm gonna air check it to see that the drum goes in both directions to apply the uh, underdrive frictions the overdrive frictions and the reverse frictions. You have uh, three sets of frictions. You have 10 frictions all together. And uh, this is a one unit drum. Uh, the pistons go forward or backwards. It depends on which clutch you're trying to hold or to break or to apply. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue disassembling this, this. What I do here, I just tap it with the hammer, with the back of my hammer and remove it and you, you can all already see that it's got brand new O-rings. They're still blue in color and red in color. Uh, when they get old, uh, they, uh, they get discolored. They look actually black. Now here we have a lip seal and this lip seal looks in good shape. I mean, it's brand new lip seal. But here you can see some, uh, some wear on this hub. And this is what I was talking to you about. Uh, sometimes the forward piston cocks sideways a little bit, and it starts digging a groove in the, where where it actually seals. And I don't see that groove here anywhere. So uh, my guess would be that this has been replaced for a new one. So you have a lip seal here, you have two uh, O-rings here, and then you have another lip seal down here. So we have all, all of our lip seals here in this uh, assembly. We do have another lip seal here. 
and you will not see this any longer uh, on the kits but on the earlier kits you would see that the thickness of this uh, lip seal on the 89 and uh, to, I believe 92 the thickness was uh, thicker than this one and you would have uh, both uh, lip seals in the kit and if you would put the wrong one you would cause the same issue as what we're having here but in this case it's got the right one and the lip goes down uh, the fluid holds up now we're going to go ahead and get this piston away from the other piston so we're just going to push on the back right here and get these two pistons out and here we have another lip seal have another lip seal here just make sure that the lip it, it is pointing down and I can see there's a lot of trash in here in between the grooves of the lip seals I mean you can see all that gray stuff on it for now we're looking to uh, check it to see that everything is there and it is here's an o-ring so everything inside this drum is where it's supposed to be the only issue so far was uh, uh, the clearance was too tight on the uh, underdrive frictions now we're going to move to the valve body to see if we're going to find any other issues there in the valve body all right so here we have our input drum disassembled already and uh, as we see we don't see any issues these guys are actually doing a pretty good job on their transmissions uh, for an automotive shop that they don't specialize in, specialize in transmissions I mean they're they're getting there all right well uh, let's let me get the bench a uh, little bit of space here on the bench so I can get the valve body on it and uh, inspect that okay so here we are on our valve body and uh, the first thing I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to remove the, uh, the linkage here just to get it out of the way This just comes up. Here we have our uh, transmission range sensor, or what you might want to call our neutral safety switch. So, if you have an issue with the transmission range sensor as well, you need to pull the valve body and to replace this. Now, there's uh, two different types, and on this one here, you can see that it's a flat pin and the earlier models are round pins all right now uh, I'm gonna go ahead and remove our 2-4 uh, accumulator piston and on 95 models I mean if you're a tranny guy I mean you remember that they used to have a, uh, an aluminum accumulator piston in here they would like to crack and leak uh, it would crack from the bottom and you would have a 2-4 uh, frictions uh, smoked, it would smoke those frictions. In this case, we have an aluminum one, so we don't worry about that one. But if you do have a uh, plastic one, my recommendation is to uh, install uh, an aluminum one just like the one we just got out. Now we're going to remove our solenoid pack. Yeah, let me change impact here. the impact instead of screwdriver. Four bolts hold our solenoid pack. And here's our solenoid pack. It has a solenoid pack uh, filter. And like I mentioned before, it's missing one of these clips goes right here holds our filter together and I hope that wasn't causing an issue when the filter will be kind of flexing and uh, causing some uh, pump cavitation and uh, if that would be the case you would have a, a code for a pump prime okay so now let's go ahead and remove the rest of the uh, valve body bolts torch 25 t25 torch head A very common issue with this uh, uh, valve bodies 
It's a uh, P1776 Probo code. And uh, for some reason on uh, Intrepid or uh, 42LEs is most common than on the 41Ts or 604s. Seventeen seventy six is a solenoid switch valve stuck in low reverse. Very common code to see on this type of vehicle. In this case, uh, supposed to, supposedly we did not have that issue. I don't know for sure until we get done with this unit and go drive it and see uh, if that code will come uh, pop up or not. And if it is, it means what it says. Solenoid switch valve stuck in low reverse. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I'm not going to get into that code yet. If it does come up, then uh, we'll discuss that later. Okay, we see that the valve body is kind of dirty. I'm not sure uh, if this valve body was opened up or not. But, I mean, you can see there that it's not in the great shape as the rest of the unit. Let's go ahead and take our separator plate and remove it. We have two long bolts and two short bolts. We're going to remove this hold down plate, and this hold down plate needs to be there. Don't forget to put it on. You will cause some. You will cause some issues. This filter needs to be there. I've done some units when this filter is not is not present. Here we have our uh, a thermal element, and it works by fluid pressure. And it opens up a little passage, as you see here. Opens and closes a little passage. So I can get this closer. Close the shot. Right there it's open. Close, open, close. That also needs to be there. This is our uh, separator plate. Kind of dirty, both, both ends. Got out of the way. Now, this is just a channel plate casting. In this casting, there is nothing there. I mean, but the trash is in there. No, nothing will come out except for the uh, thermal element that goes here. Now, this being a uh, 42LE takes uh, four check balls, and on 95 only, uh, you will have uh, five check balls. Let's see how many check balls will come out of here. I'm gonna drain some fluid and then I'm gonna uh, we're gonna talk about that. Okay, so we got four check balls, and uh, this is the position of the check balls. I'm gonna go ahead and install it, get closer to the camera. Talk about that. Now check balls are very important. Uh, they have to be there. So uh, the position on the 42 LE check check balls, you got four, you got one, two, three, and four. Four check balls. That's one, two, three, and four. Four check balls. Now on the 41 TEs, this ball does not belong there, which is the 604. But on the uh, 42 LEs and the 42 R LEs, you have four check balls. And on the 95 only, you have five. Okay, so let's get those check balls out of the way. The valve body looks a little bit dirty. Uh, here is your solenoid switch valve, and it is stuck. It's stuck in one position. One position is low reverse and one position is uh, lockup. And this uh, switch valve is dragging. I mean, I can, I can already feel that. I'm surprised it did not have a code, or it probably did, but they, didn't, they couldn't drive it too much uh, for the code to pop up. I mean, remember that they can't deliver this unit, but I already moved the valve a little bit with my pick. And I'm barely touching the valve, and you have to be careful when you're using a, a pick like this. I recommend you use a flat screwdriver when you do this, uh, because if you damage the valve, if you nick the side of the valve, 
uh, you're gonna you're gonna create a problem. You're gonna cause this valve to stick. The T1776 will come on, and uh, the other option that you would have is uh, change the switch valve for another known good one, or get an uh, oversized uh, solenoid switch valve, ring the valve body, and that would take care of your problem. But here, here we see that now it is floating. It's a free floating valve. See, now we're in the bottom position. I don't think I don't think the camera is picking this up. Let me flip this over for the valve to go down. Now it is floating. If I get a little closer here, let me get underneath this land. And you would see that the valve, yeah, I can see the valve. All right, well, manual valve goes here, and then you have some uh, torque converter clutch valves and our pressure regulator valve. Everything in the valve body seems all right. I mean, except for the trash that was there, but once we get this valve cleaned up, this is a very uh, a common issue that the solenoid switch valve will get stuck. You would get uh, a different code associated with this valve, and uh, it is a high failure rate on the 42 LEs and the 42 RLEs. Uh, 45 RFEs, I don't see a problem with the solenoid switch valve, but and on the 41 TEs or 604s, uh, it is not that common and let's change the solenoid pack and trash falls in there and then you uh, you would have that code. So one of the reasons would be uh, contamination like on the 604s you change the solenoid pack, the solenoid pack is on the outside of the unit there's a lot of dirt that accumulates on it you take the solenoid pack off and uh, you have the feed holes going into the valve body dirt goes in there starts sticking up this valve you cause that it could get stuck in the either low reverse position or on the overdrive position, I mean on the uh, lock-up position. You would have a TCC, a uh, solenoid switch valve lock in TCC or solenoid switch valve lock uh, stuck in low reverse. It depends on uh, which way uh, it gets stuck. Another reason, uh, it's uh, valve body wear, valve body bore wear, and that the uh, valve actually, uh, these little plugs here, the end plugs here, they get caught sideways and uh, they prevent the valve from moving. The valve itself likes to wear as well the uh, uh, it's anodized aluminum and the anodization of the valve wears out and uh, uh, one way to tell is when they get a little shiny. Let me see if I can get this out. You see uh, this, this, this coloration on the valve itself it gets a little shiny then you know that your uh, Valve is getting worn out. I'm just going to use the, one of the M plus for as a sample. I'm going to use this M plug right here. See, it looks uh, kind of dark grayish. It's actually aluminum that they do some kind of uh, a plating on it, electroplating. It's called anodized. And whenever you see uh, bare aluminum, is worn out. Now this is at the edge of the plug. I mean, uh, it doesn't really matter because uh, that's not where, where they like to wear. But if you see bare aluminum where it actually rides inside the board, then you have an issue. Then that valve is trash, and you need to replace that trash. Let me see if I can get this other one out. Sometimes they get hung up, you know, coming out. Little plug here, they get caught sideways, like I say. See, the solenoid switch valve is down here, and this plug already got caught sideways. It's coming out. There is an updated uh, solenoid switch valve end plug where uh, Sonics, I mean, uh, they drill, uh, one of these is drilled. And the other one has uh, like a guide, so they won't, so they won't cock sideways. Sometimes they get cocked sideways like that, and they get stuck in the bore. That's a very nice valve. I mean, if your valve body's not worn out, I do recommend putting one of those on. Here's our solenoid switch valve. You want to go all the way around it. Make sure that you don't see uh, bare aluminum. If you see bare aluminum, then this valve is destroyed.
One reason I don't uh, I don't recommend you use a pick like this. My, the tip is already gone, right? But I mean, I am very careful when when I'm getting it out. Make sure uh, I make sure that I'm down here and not at the edge. If you use a pick and then you uh, pick it at the edge of the of one of these lands, uh, that little nick that you create is going to cause a valve to stick. So I don't recommend you using this. I know I use this. I shouldn't have. I know some of you guys are gonna get in hell because of that, but I mean, let's go ahead and use that as an example. Use a flat head like this here, and then you can get your move your valve out. All right, so uh, there we have it. Uh, 40, 42 LE out of a Dodge Intrepid, uh, having a bind up, and. So far, this is what we've found. We have uh, two tight, two uh, frictions uh, sandwiched together to make a thicker friction. And on some units, you can do this. And uh, if your clearance is just too loose on some units, and but you have to be inside the uh, specifications. If you go outside your specifications, if you go too tight you're going to create a problem. If you're too loose, uh, you're going to create a problem as well. Uh, I recommend everybody, I mean, that's watching all of my videos, get your manuals, buy your manuals. You can get them from uh, ATSG or ATRA. Uh, your local parts supplier uh, would have uh, transmission manuals. Not local parts suppliers like automotive, but uh, local transmission parts suppliers so you want to get parts for your transmission, just Google uh, local transmission parts suppliers or local transmission parts and uh, you go buy your transmission parts there, buy your manuals there and uh, go inside the specifications and don't go outside your specifications like what I see here and you're going to eliminate a lot of issues. I know videos are good you know, and I'm trying to put these videos out for you guys and uh, uh, sometimes seeing is believing and when you're looking at stuff like this it's easier to catch on than reading a book but I still strongly recommend talk to your transmission local transmission part supplier and uh, get your manuals ATSG ATRA or whatever they they provide for you guys get the manual get the specs measure everything and one thing that I've learned uh, years ago was uh, check everything assume nothing so uh, I want to get that point across check everything assume nothing check your clearances check your uh, frictions check your valves and uh, assume and assume nothing all right well the, this is Hiram and I hope you enjoyed this video and if you, if you did uh, go to my YouTube channel and subscribe and every time I get a new video out uh, you're gonna be one of the first ones to be notified uh, so there we have it, 42 LE uh, Chrysler unit on a Dodge Intrepid.